that are placed by our Stephen ministers uh, and in memory of 11 members of our church who passed away since the last time we met together in this space. And uh, also three red roses uh, to celebrate three births within our church family since we last met here. So uh, you know, again, hard to find words to, to uh, speak of all that but uh, anyway that's what those are for I received a phone call this morning from Susan Daniels um, asking that we keep in our prayers Phil Daniels sister Betty Daniels who fell this morning and uh, apparently has broken her hip and, and is, is uh, a couple other injuries and so forth so she's at the hospital right now and, and they ask prayers for for Betty and we'll include Betty uh, along with all the other folks in our prayer list uh, when we come to our corporate prayers later in the service. Uh, oh, about the roses up here. If one of those roses, you know, should go to you, please take it with you uh, after the service. Or if you live near somebody that you can perhaps uh, voluntarily take the rose to them. We'd like to try to get all these to the appropriate people 
uh, after the service today. So any help that you can give us with that would certainly be appreciated. Any other announcements? Anybody? Anything at all to share? Just glad you're back. Yes. Yeah. 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 It feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, again, I, I welcome to all of you. Welcome, welcome indeed. Let's take time now during the prelude to center ourselves before God and prepare for worship.
Everlasting God, you always keep watch over us. And you know our joys and our sorrows. So we gather before you now to worship you, to adore you, to praise you. Help us each to receive your love. Refresh us this day, one and all, with unexpected mercies. Startle us, everyone, with new commands for our obedience and with a fresh sense of your grace. Through Christ we pray. Amen. I might just stand here and say for this for a moment. <laughs> This is so fun for you to be confused, you know. It has been 447 days since we last gathered together in this space of worship. 447 days. That comes out to 63 Sundays. 63 consecutive Sundays that this room has remained empty. It is so good to be back. As I said a moment ago, you look good. It is wonderful to see you. Well, now as you might imagine, as I thought about what I might say today on this first day of our return to in-person worship, I gave it a lot of thought, trying to figure out where to begin, where to, where to get back into things. And, and there were two, two themes primarily that, that came to mind. One was the image of Jonah in the belly of a whale. Because to me, it, it sort of symbolized how COVID swallowed us up. And now, finally, we're starting to find our way back into the light of day. We're not completely there yet, but it seems that we're on the way. So one of the things I thought about preaching on was, was Jonah. But then I, I found myself thinking about Noah and the ark. And that's the direction I finally decided to take today. The story of Noah, the people and the animals closed up tight inside the ark for all those days. It's as if COVID has kept us confined inside that dark, dank ark for so long. So that's where we're going today. We're going to go with Noah. Now first, a little background. The story of Noah is the ancient Hebrew way of reflecting on the responsibility and the accountability of humankind under the sovereignty of God. And it is through this story that you can focus on the assertion that God brought us into this world and we can be taken right on out again. That's one way of looking at the story. Frankly, though, it's not my preferred way of making sense of the story, so here's an alternative. Another way of looking at this story, a much better way, I think, is this. To see this story of Noah and the ark, this old, old story, to see that the lesson of this is that God's primary goal is our deliverance is our salvation, not our destruction. God wants to keep us. God wants to keep us and God wants to be one with us. It's not a story that tells us that God wants to get with us. So if you could see this as a story of grace, not a story of God's anger, not a story of God's punishment, but a story of God's love, a story of God's grace. That's how I want us to see this story. Now, Noah. Noah first shows up um, at the end of the fifth chapter of Genesis. And there we learn that his grandfather was Methuselah. 
Methuselah, the celebrated Old Testament fellow who lived to the ripe old age of 969, it says. And Methuselah had a son named Lamech, and Lamech had a son whom he named Noah. As the story unfolds, it's not a pleasant world that Noah lives in. God sees that, that humankind is not measuring up. The world is full of evil. The world is full of wickedness. And it makes God regretful. And as the scripture puts it, quote, when the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time, God was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. So God has some regret. And God is filled with regret to the point that the decision is made to wipe the slate clean. To start off, except for Noah. In the story, God is pleased with Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah and his family would be preserved as the first inhabitants of a new, improved creation. And the story continues. God lets Noah know what's coming. God gives Noah instructions on building an ark, directions on the birds and the animals that are going to be rounded up and taken on board. I expect you pretty much know this story. And you pretty much know what's coming in this story. The rains come. The floods rise. The world is destroyed. Everything goes except the ark and its contents. Forty days and nights of rain. Then another 150 days of just floating around. And then slowly the water starts to go down. All told, like oh, it would be over a year. Over a year before Noah and his fellow travelers would be able to get out of the ark and return to some semblance of normal life. Finally, the day comes. The day comes when this, this floating zoo, as it were, is able to unload and filled with the hope of a new beginning. The first thing Noah and his family do is to worship the God who delivered them. In the hope of a new beginning, Noah worships. And God responds. God decides, quote, never again will I put the earth under a curse because of what people do. Never again will I destroy all living beings as I have done this time. As long as the world exists, there will be a time for planting and a time for harvest. There will always be cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. After having made that decision, God speaks to Noah, saying, quote, I am now making my covenant with you and with your descendants, with all living beings, all birds and all animals, everything that came out of the boat with you. God makes a promise. And the promise is no more wipeouts like this one. Ever again. And God says, it's kind of like putting a post-it note on the refrigerator door to remind you of something. God says, I'm hanging my bow in the sky. Whenever I cover the sky with clouds and the rainbow appears, I will remember my promise to you and to all the animals that a flood will never again destroy all living beings. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember everlasting covenant between me and all living beings on earth. That is the sign of the promise which I have made to all living beings. God makes a promise. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the language of this story of Noah, the Hebrew language, the language in which it was written, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. In Hebrew, this story has a kind of sing-song quality to it, okay? Sort of sing-song, but it's not, that's not reflected at all well in the English translation. But in Hebrew, it reads almost like a nursery rhyme. 
or a fable, or, or even kind of like poetry. And I know that some people choose to read these early chapters of Genesis as literal history, as factual science, but this style of Hebrew writing suggests that you don't have to. You don't have to understand these chapters that way. But instead, you could interpret them as stories that try to answer deep questions. Stories that try to answer the deep and profound questions that all people have. Imagine it. Imagine a, an ancient Hebrew grandparent with a grandchild on his or her knee trying to answer that grandchild's question about where people come from and where animals and birds and trees come from. Well, that's the sense of the Genesis story of the Garden of Eden, for instance. Or to answer where all the evil in the world comes from, we hear the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent. And to answer why people speak so many different languages, we hear the story of the Tower of Babel. And if that's the case with Noah, then the thing for us to consider is what would be, what would be the deep question that this story is trying to answer? What's the, the question that the story of Noah and the ark is trying to answer? And one quick and obvious response to that is the story explains to pre-scientific Hebrew people where rainbows come from. There's something much, much deeper going on than that. There's a whole lot more to it than that. The deeper question being answered here is this. Since the world is such an evil place, why doesn't God just wipe it out? Why doesn't God just wipe it out? The answer is this story. The promise God makes with no Never. So there's more than one way of looking at it. More than one way of looking at this story. Let's suppose you were a newspaper reporter and you were writing out an account of what happened to Noah and your headline might be, God destroys world. Or, you could let your headline be, God gives humans another chance. If your headline is, God destroys world, then you go on in your article to describe and more about what can happen when God is mad. But if your headline is, God gives humans another chance, then your article is a story of love. Your article is a story of grace. The grace of God who makes such an astonishing promise, even while knowing full well that the world and its people will be what they will be anyway. It is important that we get this story right. It is important because this story has something in it that we all very much need to recover right now, and that's a sense of hope. Hope for humankind. Hope for the church. Hope for everything good in a world that is tough to make sense of and tough to live in and filled with lots of things that are not good. We need hope. And this is a story of hope. So hold on to it. Do not let loose of the story of Noah because after the flood there's a rainbow and there's a promise and I wouldn't want any of you to live without that kind of hope. There is a great old Peanuts comic, remember Peanuts? Charles Schultz, there's a great old Peanuts comic in which Linus and Lucy are standing inside on a stormy day, and they're looking outside the window watching the rain, and Lucy says, if it doesn't stop raining, everything will be washed away. And Linus says, oh no, Genesis chapter 9 said, that's like, never again will God wash everything away. And Lucy says, thank you, that is a great comfort to me. And Linus says, Sound theology will do that. <laughs> Remember in the old movie, The Wizard of 
God, that's how Julie, Judy Garland captured everybody's imagination when she sang somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. There's a land I heard of once in a lullaby. A better world. A place you could escape to when the hard knocks of life threatened to overwhelm. Somewhere over the rainbow. The reality is that as a feeling as a magical flight to somewhere over the rainbow may seem, we can take comfort in knowing that we live under the rainbow. We live under the rainbow. God's promise of grace soars over us as a kind of divine punctuation mark at the end of every storm. To be sure, we get pounded. Get flooded sometimes. Time and time again, the pain and the trouble and the heartache that come in waves. COVID has been no piece of cake. We are under the rainbow. Grief is overwhelming. The stress may be about to drown us. The abuse may wear us down. But we are under the rainbow. And that is God's promise. You take it to the back. It's not about a make-believe place somewhere over the rainbow, no. It's about something real. It's about here and now, where we are. We live under the rainbow. It is the promise that no matter what, we belong to God. In life and in death, we belong to God. So thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. morning. Before I sing, I just want to let you know that Linda and I have created or have, uh, have found more close friendships and relationships in this church than any other place that we've ever been. And we're going to miss each and every one of you. We will be back, just not regularly. We love you all.
praise. 